Hey folks, it's Blamo. I'm Jeremy Kirkland, your host, your guy, your uh, your favorite bald dude. You know who it is. I'm just chopping it up. New week, new week, new episode with the uh, with the Lord of the Fit Pick or the Fit Vid. I don't know, but he's he's a real big dog. Before we jump in, just a bit of a temp check with y'all. We, we all doing okay? Feel like uh, there's some there's been a real vibe shift. I don't know what it is. Uh, I don't even know if it's a vibe shift. I'm just being weird. But like, it just feels like everyone's a little bit on edge right now. I mean, look, of course, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. But, you know, I'm just I'm I'm always trying to be that optimist. I'm trying to trying to chase that that good feeling. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm just in denial. But um, I have been doing some late night e lately. You know, that's a good thing to make things feel better. Just uh, just buying a few different pairs of vintage chinos, whatever I'm doing. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, sure, of course, why not? But I got, I got to dial it in, you know, I've been, I've been leaning into some, uh, some bigger full rise pants, you know, a couple things with some, a little bit of double pleats. I just, now I just got to get that gym bod ready for summer and then, uh, then your boy will be great. But you know, I'm just, I'm really into getting some nice new pants. Speaking of pants, um, my guest this week is Albert Musquiz. You might know him as uh, Edgy Albert, or he's, a, he's the guy in your feed telling you what pants to wear. He's a real dude, and I am very glad he's here. Albert and I chat how he became the gene daddy of the internet. <laughs> That's serious. Visiting the Levi's archive, his acting career, sick French knives, and LBJ the play. Dig in, dig deep. Here we go. How is the life over there in sunny, sunny L.A.? Sunny LA is is good. It's it's fine. You know, uh, we are having a this is sort of banal sounding to say we're having a funny winter here. It's been it's been chilly by our standards. And um, the thing about apartments in LA is that they're not insulated for any kind of weather at all. Oh. So, you know, because like they're just assuming it'll be, <laughs> you know, pleasant. Um, so winter really hits here. You're sort of like <laughs> you have to really bundle up indoors, even though it's not as cold as, you know, New York or certainly where you are. Um, it's still a, it's still a pain. All that climate but, um, change, man. No, nobody fucking knows the change. weather anymore. Yeah. We don't know. But um, what you, all things considered. Yeah. What have you been up to lately? So, I mean, I, to kind of like set the stage here, I remember getting connected to you through maybe Andrew Chen because you were mm. like a writer or you were writing. Mm. Mm-hmm. For pedals? Mm-hmm. Okay. Correct. Yes, correct. And then, and this is years and years ago. Uh-huh. And then all of a sudden, you blow up on the internet with these kind of confessional style pep talk. I don't, I don't know, I don't know how to describe this style of video, but it's basically a video I feel like you really kind of help pioneer, which is just this kind of like educational, humorous ways of very traditional dressing in like of a, of a certain era. You know, it's like if Paul Newman all of a sudden got into clothes and had a TikTok, it would be you. Wow. Cause there's like, you know, it's, it's this like handsome man, this kind of like, I don't know. It's, it's, it's very difficult to describe. Cause even then when like I had some notes and stuff before we were going, I was like, I don't even know how to put my finger on kind of like this juggernaut that you've created in, uh, <laughs> of, of male empowerment that isn't, you know, bad and toxic. I don't know. It's it's really great. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. <laughs> it is hard to explain. And it's also hard to even know what I'm doing. It's hard to remember because it's like it's you're always at the whim of the algorithm and the internet. Oof, and yeah. And the landscape is shifting all the time. And and you know, every day it seems there's a new there's a new hot guy with clothes on oh, yeah. and he's And he's he's coming right for my jugular. (laughs) And um, so you have to it it gets hard to even remember, like, what is the thing that I'm doing here? Why? Why? Why am I here? What what's going on? Um, And so you just have to kind of weather the storm as best you can. And and I find the best way is just like, yeah, keep 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 doubling down on the thing I like, which is clothes and yeah. Yeah. Well, let's jump back cuz like where yeah. where are you from originally? You're from California? Yeah, I'm from South Pasadena, which is, you know, a suburb of LA. Mm-hmm. And um 
Yeah, I grew up here. I went to a performing arts high school out here, a public performing arts high school called Loxa, which is really awesome. I mean, it's like a weird school, but it was super awesome. Define weird. And then uh, it was, I mean, like public school in California is super underfunded, Mm -hmm. but this was like the most underfunded school. Like, and the, the, my freshman year there was the first year that they'd had a principal there longer than one year. Oh, so it was like it was like a revolving door of these very bizarre characters that like didn't really fit into any other school district in, I guess, the state. And we had half of the day all for arts classes. So that's like a whole other group of like kooky kind of actor people that were, you know, a lot of Godspell uh, renditions or something. No Godspell, but it was just a very surreal way to do high school. And I honestly, it was perfect for me because there were no like conventional high school cliques. Oh. Um, yeah. I mean, I was in, it was an arts high school. I maybe said theater. It was an arts high school. I did theater. Um, no conventional cliques, just like people from all over the city. Like people were bussed in like from two hours away sometimes. And it was the coolest because it was just like the most diverse cast of characters you could assemble in the city. Mm. And everyone was there because they just like really loved art. <laughs> and it was, you know, it was like kind of kooky, like kids would just kind of leave whenever they wanted or there's a lot of misbehaving, but it was a very sort of endearing kind of misbehaving because it's like these were like theater kids or dancers yeah. or painters and and their rebellion was pretty uh, tame in comparison <laughs> to what you might see elsewhere. OK, um, so you, and you, yeah. go to, you go to school there. When, when does like clothing enter the picture? I mean, it sounds like it was kind of always there, though, right? Not really. I mean, I think. I think people kind of retcon it. You know, if someone from high school finds my stuff online, they're like, oh, yeah, I used to dress so well in high school. And Mm -hmm. I don't really think that's the case. (laughs) I I mean, I definitely I definitely was curious about clothing, but I didn't I didn't know about all the menswear stuff that was happening online. I had no access to that. And as far as I knew, clothes were just like what they had at Urban Outfitters or H&M for and. Right. And um, more utilitarian I, of like need shirt, buy shirt, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I definitely was like trying to experiment with it. Like I remember at some point I discovered Clark's for the first time. I thought those were so cool. Uh, actually, I was just sent two boxes by Clark's today. Hey. And yeah. And um, something that was kind of it's been it's embarrassing in retrospect. I didn't know it was embarrassing until I got to college on the East Coast. But in this like little beach town that I went to with my parents, I found topsiders for the first time. Okay. And I had never, Sperry topsiders has absolutely no, like as a high schooler in LA, had absolutely no, I had no context for kind of what that signified. But I thought they were super cool. So <laughs> no, no clothes really. It wasn't until college that I started to dabble. And that was mostly because, I, so I went to college, I went to Vassar in New York, upstate New York. Yeah. Well, not upstate, Poughkeepsie, mm-hmm. Hudson Valley. And um, there were some kids there. For theater too? No, for history. Oh, okay. Yeah, for history. And um, majored in history, minored in French. And I was there and some kids were talking about something called selvage denim. Ah. And then that's where it all started. And uh, I went back the summer between my freshman and sophomore year. And I wasn't totally sure I wanted to go back to Vassar. It was, you know, it's, I went to this really, as I said, kind of kooky public school. We barely had any... <laughs> academics at all and i was you know surrounded by these kids that had gone to these really incredible like private prep schools and they were so serious about you know their essay writing and their studying and i felt a little out of my depth so i wasn't sure i wanted to go back yeah vassar is a pretty that's a nice school yeah i was really unprepared i was totally over my head pretty much out the gate yeah um but um over the summer i was looking for places where i could see this you know mythical selvage denim in LA. And I went to, at the time, uh, Mike Hodes's brand, Rising Sun Jeans, Mm -hmm. which was an Eagle Rock. And I went and I was just so taken by it. And because I'd been into history this whole time, and I also kind of passively was trying to understand clothes better, to see people like making clothes in this historical way with Mm -hmm. all these historical references. And there was an archive and they're making it right in front of you. And, you know, he decorated the whole thing. He has this really amazing kind of like world building ability. And it was totally old LA. It just kind of all clicked for me. I was like, wait, I can't, there's a way I can get this. I can dress better by just looking backwards, by kind of going into the historical record, which is something that I am good at. I'm not really good at anticipating trends or 
what people like or don't like, but I know what I think is maybe historically relevant. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of where it started. Ah, okay. So like, I, I, I didn't know it was Rising Sun. Because were, were, did you ever work at SelfEdge? I did later after I graduated okay. from college. I did work at SelfEdge. So you went back to you went back to Vassar. You said graduated from college. I still gra- I still went. I went back. I ultimately went back. Okay. Uh, I just I interned with Rising Sun that summer mm. and um, got my first pair of slim straight cone mills denim. Oh jeans yeah, from cone them. mills. I feel like and cone cone denim now is almost pejorative because people use it as yeah. like this way to just make something like. Have you ever heard the term uh, you can't polish a turd? Yeah. To where yeah. people have been like, but this is cone denim. And I'm like, yeah, but the jeans are still whack. Like the cut's weird and never, you know, but like there's still great cone. Let me be very, very, very clear. I'm not, you know, belittling, you know, the rising sun stuff, but like there's, the, I feel like, yeah, like people toss around cone like a ton. You're like, yeah, but it's, you know, that brand or that brand. But so you, you're, you're, you're full denim. You're interning now. Yeah, I did this internship and I don't know how how much of a value add I was to the company. I probably wasn't at all, but it was cool. I met uh, Phil Preuss, who went on to start Lady White Co. He yeah. was working there at the time. Um, and I learned a lot. I don't think I was very helpful to them, but I was always around and Come I was on. absorbing information. Um, and it was really, really formative for me and then i mean rising sun kind of it really changed at that point i Mm -hmm. think mike mike went on to other things so kind of it wasn't really the same thing anymore um it was the first time i met people that were just wearing really big pants you know it's like because i went in and i was on you know the uh raw denim subreddit where everybody was you know wearing super slim tapered stuff and then these guys who are actually in the it's this thing right where you like you have this on when you're out on the outside you have a really particular idea of like, what is cool? What do people like? And then right. when you're inside and there's the like tastemakers and designers and stuff, they're like, oh no, we don't actually fuck with that. We're <laughs> kind of on some whole other level. Um, so yeah, went back to Vassar. Uh, I wrote my senior thesis on the history of Levi's jeans. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. Does and Levi's know this? Cause you're like a Levi's guy partner now or something, right? Levi's does know this. And actually in two days, or I don't know, it'll be probably not line up with when this comes out but uh two days from now i'm getting to finally go to the levi's archives in san francisco which i've been trying to go to for seven years oh my god and they're finally letting me in there you're getting Uh, do you get like the special gloves and stuff to look at some of the yeah some of the the old denim i sure hope so i'm gonna (laughs) touch it all (laughs) if i can uh yeah so i did that and then i i was teaching english in france for a little bit whoa came back Yes. How was that? Yes. Where in France? Bad. Uh, it was bad. Uh, <laughs> I, it was in this really small town called Mond. Uh, it's in Lozère, which is like a small region in the south of France, um, but not like the sexy, like warm part of the south of France. Okay. It's like in this mountainous, cold region on your way down south. And um, I, I think I just was really stressed about leaving school. A lot of my peers, you know, we're going to go do business or, you know, things that were yeah. very kind of. Dad said he's going to hire me this year. Here I go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I had never been good at like, I didn't really know what, what the plan was. Um, I'm also an actor and I did a lot of comedy in college. And that was really kind of my favorite thing about school. And I knew that it was going to be a, an uphill battle to get to do any of that. So I was and I liked clothes, but didn't know how that was going to work into the how that was going to kind of fit into the picture. And. I was starting to write for Heddle, so that was something at yeah, the time. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, so yeah, I kind of shipped off to this to teach English in this. Well, they assign you. I didn't when I signed on. It seemed like I was going to be in Montpellier, which is like a really fun city. Uh, but then they kind of switched up on you once you've signed the contract. And oh. I was in a really small town, and um, so you weren't was, you weren't a fan. No, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I also studied abroad in Paris. Every time, okay. every time I, every time I live in France, I, I like romanticize it on my way in, and then when I get there, I'm like, oh right, this is it just yeah, just getting dropped off in a foreign country and having to re remember all my French is like it's like a constant migraine. <laughs> um, and at the time, I was like pretty fluent in French. Like I could, I was making jokes in French that people thought were passably funny. And okay, uh, but it's just crazy. Like even when you're like at a degree of fluency, it, it doesn't mean that it's not still hard. It's not like it's not like you reach some like nirvana state where everything is good and you're. It's like 
okay, I can speak the language, but I'm still pretty alone here in this small town. So were you, did you like get to hunt for any like clothes or workwear or at the time were you just kind of like not as into it yet? I was into it. My first, when I studied abroad in Paris in 2015, that was the first time I bought Paraboot. Oh, um, so I'd like to say, I'd like to put on the record that I was a little bit ahead of that curve. <laughs> uh, and when I was in, when I was in, uh, Mons, it was it it was just like a small town anywhere it just felt like uh, people just wanted to be in a bigger city there right. wasn't a ton of like there was certainly no like vintage culture there um i did go to toulouse at one point and there was a famous um french workwear store there that i went to and i had a really i found some really amazing um you know like moleskin pants and yeah. stuff but yeah i didn't I didn't do a ton of shopping. The region I was in was famous for its like handmade knives. That's what they were more famous like, for. Like like Laguiol stuff. Oh, Laiol is how it's pronounced. Wait, I, wait, can you say it again? Laiol. Laiol. Shit. Yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and apologize <laughs> to everyone. I have been mispronouncing Laguiol correctly as it's. I, I I can't even correct myself on the record. I don't even know how to fucking say it. L- Laiol. Laiol. Yeah. Man. It's it's. I mean. I, I'm I'm do I want to just spare you any future embarrassment. I, I've there's been so many times I've been in France where there's some word where they're like, "You are so stupid for saying it that way." And I'm like, "I'm sorry, I didn't." No, know. first off, thank you for correcting me. I I was <laughs> while while you said that, I went to go look for my Lyle knife because I yeah they're beautiful. Yeah, it was cool. I remember I, you know the person I got it from Sid Mashburn. <laughs> Wow. Okay. This cool. is, you know, now I'm really dating myself because I don't know if you remember at, I think it was around this time, Sid Mashburn, or maybe even earlier, he had an e com shop, but it was through, I think it was through like an e com sort of like guilt group sort of provider mm. called Tegan. I think it was T E I G E N. Mm. And it would be a place where you could buy some brands that didn't have e-com. I mean, if you think about this, it was basically like Farfetch before Farfetch and stuff. Mm-hmm, and so they mm-hmm. worked with these these other small like boutiques. I think it was like them. It was like RTH might have been on it at one point. But it was like places that like didn't want to deal with e-com, but were very like hot, cool buzz stores. And he mm-hmm. sold um, Vess Lyle knives. And got uh, I, I got mm-hmm. to keep saying it. And, <laughs> um, and, uh, and I think like, you know, Oxford's oh and double monk strap shoes and it was like that was the mix that they were selling on there and Justin Doss the OG uh pre GQ fashion director was like hawking mm. things because they would sell each each um each thing through a video if you think Got about it. this it was like so far ahead of its time in all these ways where like they'd introduce a product in the form of like now people would say like a TikTok style video it would right. be someone be like hey what's up you know it's like this is Matt Lambert this is like pre him doing you know um factors and everything be like we got these new shirts they're pretty great come check it out see ya (laughs) (laughs) but that's where i first got my taste of lyle knives and i still i still have them it's that they're sick man so were you cutting some sausages and uh (laughs) cheese and just like cruising around i mean this is none of these things sound bad by the way you're talking about how this was a little bit of a different time and like i'm in heaven over here well it's just you know i think i think you know when you graduate from college if you had a good time in college Mm -hmm. it's always going to be weird and i was going through a lot of weirdness and i was sort of unsure of what i was going to do and i thought it was going to be a good idea to kind of you know not like i guess kind of kill time but like have an experience and it was kind of unimpeachable like my mom's friends couldn't be like oh what's your son doing that loser he's going to france like you know it was like okay he's going to france that's cool yeah you know like He's got a thing and I just wanted everybody to be off my back, basically. Uh, and okay. And I I went, I just wanted there to be, you know, like less pressure and and it's just, you know, I did do some like really fun solo traveling. I mean, as fun as solo traveling is always so intense. And especially like I was just like 21 and I went to a lot of cool places and I had a lot of really cool experiences. But like, yeah, I was like teaching and living in this boarding school basically, and like the yeah. kids we're all from like farm country around the town. And so they would board during the week and then they would leave. And then as it got colder, the the school started doing this thing where when all the kids had gone home, they would turn off the heat. Okay. So so like that meant that I was, there was no heat in the building that I was living in, like in the winter in the mountains. Is this holdovers Um, in in France? (laughs) Kind of. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, yeah. And then like, I mean, you get crazy long, vacations as an because i was like an employee of the french government through this 
So you get like vacations and you can leave for a while and you have to leave because there's no heat in the building. Yeah, so fair. <laughs> um, it was just it was strange. And I think maybe if I had been a little older, I would have been able to appreciate it a little bit more. But pretty soon I was and also all these kids were from like rural France and I would I would talk to them about, you know, living in L.A. and like, yeah, the, the sheer size of the city of L.A. And then, you know, after class, like one by one, they'd be like, why are you here? Why did you come here? <laughs> And then after a while, I was like, why did I come here? <laughs> like, I, I felt it, yeah. like, yeah. yeah, I was like, I feel like my life is waiting for me. And I, mm. I, I'm not in the right place. I don't feel like I'm totally in the wrong place. Like this, this, you know, experience I thought that would enrich me and be all these things is doing that maybe passively, but I think I need to get home and kind of get to it. So you, so you come back, you start yeah. working at Self Edge. Yeah, it was. I I was just writing for Heddles and I thought maybe I could kind of like live at home and make it work for a while. But mm -hmm. then um, I, I for no I don't know why, but I, I guess I had wanted a pair of the CS jeans, you know, like they discontinued the 316 yep. discontinued the CS for ages and they recently brought it back. But there was like a few of the last pairs that were on sale. This is like 2017, 2018. Mm hmm. And I used like the last money pretty much in my bank account to buy a pair. I don't know why I did that. And then I was like, you know what? Maybe to like redeem this bad decision, I'll email the 316 email and see if they have any jobs for me. And um, 316 didn't have a job, but Johan brought me over to Kia mm -hmm. and I worked at Self Edge for three years. Well, three years. Three years. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. In, at, yeah. in LA. In LA. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, self edge LA, and um, yeah, I mean, it, like in terms of an education in like fashion and product and like styling, it's it's incomparable. Just like you learn so much. I mean, I already like loved denim and knew a lot about it, but I learned so much more by like actually being in the trenches and and you know working with the product and stuff and meeting the people. It was crazy. Yeah, I do think that's something that a lot of people, especially now in this age of ecom right? Like e-commerce, everything. There's, I mean, I worked retail, like retail was probably, I mean, I was a dishwasher first, but then like my first, like I have more than gas money sort of job. I worked at like Banana Republic and, you know, stuff like that. And I remember just being in a retail environment and getting your hands on product and having to learn about that product. Even at that time, like for me, I wasn't like that into Banana Republic other than the Dawson Chino, which by the way, you should look for that fucking sick as hell best one of the best fitting pants of all time kind of a flared leg it's like a dickies 874 a little bit more exaggerated in every way um anyway but I'm like there. yeah i work but like just being in a retail environment like forces you to have this completely different experience from product the way that mm -hmm. people do now through e-com i mean because you are touching it you're feeling it you get all mm -hmm. these other things because you're now interacting with other people who have different body types who mm -hmm. they may be more drawn to product A, even though you aren't. And now through their perspective, you can see that, you know, and I think Selfage is a great example too, because everyone more or less is there for denim, but you'll have guys that are coming in that are like samurai heads, you know, um, like the brand, not the actual people. <laughs> and, you know, and then you'll have guys that are coming in that are all about Ironheart and all this stuff. And you get to kind of like find what you love about each gene. And Kia, yeah. I, I'm, I assume you got plenty of time with Kia and, Johan, where those guys are just walking encyclopedias of just the most, you know, detailed knowledge of something that I feel like people just often overlook. Yeah. And I think the interesting thing about self edge is like the people skills you have to have because yeah. you, you know, the, 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 the bar to entry is not that high as long as like a customer is friendly and willing to kind of play the game, mm -hmm. but it is it's just such a different retail experience than most people are used to. Right. Like having to, because I mean, yeah, it, there is, as you mentioned with, you know, with uh, Kia and Johan and Andrew and Dimitra and all of them, they know so much. And um, it, it, you, I feel like you need to be able to really guide the customer through the experience of knowing what all the genes, it's, it's, there's so much information and they have to be kind of game for that. And I think because retail largely is so broken yeah people are people are not used to well they're i think they're either used to like going to like target or something and the people who work there are maybe don't even know it's kind of currently at the store right now or or, or it's just they're not used to someone they're not used to someone really guiding them through the process and, and helping them find the best fit so 
you have to kind of win the customer over to that experience and kind of convince and get them to trust you. Yeah, to explain and, value to people who may not get it either. We're like, why is this Gene 400? Why is this Gene 365? They're both genes. You're like, well, they're, they're, they're not. Um, hold on, yeah. do you have a minute? Greencast left twill? What are you talking about? <laughs> right. So yeah, that's hours and hours of my day for three years. Um, and it's, but also I think the thing that's really cool is when you help someone find something that they really love. Yeah. That's like, it's amazing. And I think I learned from that, that there is always a fit, you know, there's always a fit. There's always something that's going to work and it may require, you know, letting go of your ego a little bit. It may require playing ball with this like random sales associate <laughs> you probably didn't want to talk to, but it can happen. And, and, sure. um, I think I just learned so much about how clothes fit and work and what I think is more universally flattering on more bodies and what isn't. And what do you think is more universally flattering on more bodies? I mean, a lot of this stuff oh. you've shared online, to be clear, yeah. so people can find it there. But I am curious. I think so. It's in, when I was working there, they still did not have a ton of like straight leg mm -hmm. or, or really wide leg or high waisted options. And th they were beginning to kind of make that shift. Um, and I just found I found those to be so much more comfortable and so much easier to wear. And I found to be more universally flattering on more kinds of people. And, um, you know, it was like we were shifting out of that age of the really slim taper thing. And yeah. also just like being on the floor every day wearing raw denim and like figuring out like what actually, you know, what what was I, you know, getting cool fades on? Because that was what it was all about at the time. What were you? Um, uh. Iron Heart, the Iron Heart Triple Eight. I got really good fades on that with the octopus on the back, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do the Iron Heart Triple Eight very, very underrated. I have the twenty one ounce, which I can't always wear because they're so freaking heavy. But yeah. they're probably some of the best fitting jeans I own. Yeah, yeah. I think if I could do it all over again, okay, I would have day one for my like first gifted pair. I would have picked up just the Sugar Cane nineteen forty seven. The forty seven. See, I figured you would have said sixty six. No, the 47, uh, the 66, it's I a have a slimmer, pair. right? Yeah, no, the 66 is awesome. It's great. Uh, but I think the 47 is just like, just like perfect. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and like, especially if, you know, if you're working in a store and you need to be moving all day and doing stuff like that wide leg jean, it's always going to be cool. And it's that denim is so hard to fade. It's like if I had spent yeah. three years in just one pair, I wish I'd just done one pair. I wish I'd never bought flat heads. It didn't fit me. I wish I'd never, you know, all the, all the mistakes <laughs> I made. But um, yeah, the triple eight is probably like top five fits at the self edge locations, I would say, just because it's it's like a it's like, yeah, it's like a kind of 90s. It is 80s 501 kind of fit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's funny because like, I mean, I remember going to self edge. This is right before the New York store was opening and it was me and John Moy and Andrew Chen was there. And I don't know if you remember this. There was this thing that there was this photographer named Ryan Plett, and he did this thing called the denim debate. And it was actually in, in, you know, in theory, it was a fantastic idea because it was all these different folks who all got a, a pair of jeans and they all had to like publish like how the jean wore over time. And so like some people got flatheads, some people got iron hearts, some people got this. And as a person where like, I feel like now a lot of people when they buy stuff, you figure out a brand and then you probably spend a month, if not longer, researching every aspect of it before you just like pull the trigger. And you got to see how all these things faded. And it was kind of interesting because I think that the the time of e what each person had to get, you know, to get the denim faded was so radically different because it was like some of these people was like, yeah, they, they wore it for like two months and people were like, well, have you been wearing it? It was like, yeah, I have every single day and none of this stuff worked. But like all of that stuff, you know, for me, like, especially like a brand like Sugarcane, you know, I think there's there's ways you can approach this stuff where you can go into it from like the head perspective of like, oh, but this has the hidden bar tack. Oh, but this has this. And then, you know, when you look at like how much you have to spend to get to that, because I would argue I probably have bought maybe 14, 20 pairs of jeans that I wore for a week or two, never really was able to get it. This is like over years. And then finally... I got like the gene for me. And I mean that for me, it's probably like the sugarcane 66, but like mm. even then it's just, it's so much work, but in a weird way now, like I'm kind of bummed that the work's done. Like I, mm. like there's a new, you know, what is it like, uh, is it pure, pure blue Japan? And I'm like, Oh, I should get it. And I'm like, no way this is going to fit good. But I'm like, Oh, maybe I should get it. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, I, I, there's a lot of, 
once you've once you figured it out, you've kind of figured it out, and then you're not going to go back in and yeah. Like, <laughs> and do you all over. did that happen for you? Like, did you feel like it wasn't like? Are you one of those people where it's like, look, the joy is in the journey, or you're just like, I got the gear and I'm done. Now I have time to read history. Uh, well, I mean, at least with the Japanese brands. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait a second. I got to get my bids in on the bezel app, but more on that in in a minute. I get all sorts of emails and questions from you all, which I love to read and respond. And one thing I constantly get and even read in the Blamo Slack is what watch should I buy and where should I get it? It's a wild world out there with all sorts of websites and shops, but I go to Bezel. Bezel is the trusted marketplace for buying and selling your next luxury watch with expert in-house authentication on every purchase. First off, folks, it's getbezel.com. That's getbezel.com. But I use and recommend Bezel because it's the best of both worlds. You can go to the site and browse a marketplace of luxury watches, over 16,000 of them, by the way, which is a lot. And I know that Bezel is going to authenticate your purchase. Or you can create an account and get connected with your own private client advisor called the concierge. Because look, making a watch purchase can be confusing, especially when you don't know all the reference numbers. When was this made? Did they use ceramic then? Is it a triple lop, dingle top? You know, what the heck? I don't even know. But they do at Bezel, and they're here to help. Concierge, baby. Look, if looking for your watch to mark a special occasion, or maybe you're just doing research, right? They even have their own journal where you can learn all the ins and outs about Bezel and the brands and all the stuff that's happening right now. But back to my bids. Yes, Bezel now has auctions, and not just any auctions. They got Rolex, they got Cartier, they got Audemars Piguet, all the big dogs, and more. So you can discover, bid, and know the Bezel team has got your back with verified in-house authentication. So visit getbezel.com on your smartphone or computer. Bezel, the trusted marketplace for buying or selling your next luxury watch. I spent, when I was in college and I couldn't af- afford any of it, I was doing all this like, you know, really compulsive research and I was learning like, oh, this denim does that, that does that. And then when I got to Self Edge on my first day, I was like, wait, two pairs of these jeans are going to fit me because I've always had big thighs and I was on the rowing team in college. Yeah, and- you're pretty jacked. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> but I can't wear slim. I can't wear a slim taper. Like I can't wear a low rise jean. It just does not work. Mm -hmm. It's like, um, it just is unpleasant. And, and I like when I was in college at some point, I got my first pair of, uh, five one shrink to fits. And when I was studying abroad in France, I only brought two pairs of jeans with me. I brought a pair of 316 ST 120X, the shadow selvage for those in the know. And then I brought this pair of like $40 Levi's shrink to fits. And I was like, I'm going to get these crazy fades on the shadow selvage. I'm going to, it's, I'm going to go crazy. But that cut just did not work on me. It was just too tight on me. It's a tight and cut. So I, yeah. And so I kept wearing the 501s. And obviously anybody who knows 316 knows that their shit is amazing. And this is not an indictment of that at all. That just was the absolutely the wrong fit for my body. Yeah. Uh, and so I was just like, oh, this that's when I clicked. I was like, it has to be comfortable. It has to fit over my thighs. And um, then then it'll be then it'll work. So I think I've always had that pretty big. Uh, that's those are the guidelines I'm working with when I'm shopping for stuff. I just I, they have to fit my legs. And that just cuts out a lot of the like cool Japanese brands because and also I'm 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 not like incredibly tall, but some of the brands have a really short inseam i I mean self-edge works hard to get longer inseams Mm -hmm. in but like yeah like the warehouse it's all like shrink to fit and it's a 32 inseam and it's like that's not going to be long enough after the shrink yeah so yeah so that just limits you and then you have to kind of like get resourceful based on you know those caveats and uh yeah i think i've done so since then i've i've pretty much found it you've settled on more or less 501s now is that correct or the but like Levi um, stuff, no? Yeah, I think I think I just really I love. So we had to be furloughed for a while in the pandemic at, at Self Edge. Yeah, and in that time, I started kind of messing around with Depop, and then actually, I had you know I was trying to learn more about. Well, after so long of like wearing really crunchy jeans and breaking them in myself and doing all that work, I got I found a really awesome pair of vintage 501s and i was like wait that's kind of nice the, you know I, like i had been into vintage in high school a little bit yeah but like i ha- i had lost my way for so long i was like i'll only wear it 
if I break it in myself, if yeah. it's super crunchy, yeah. like I only want the fades if they're my fades. Yeah. Um, Gotta earn my stripes, man. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I was totally like radicalized. Yeah. Uh, yeah me too. <laughs> And so when I started to get back into vintage and I was like, wait, you know, like I should have a, like a pair, if I'm going on a first date, I should have a pair of jeans that are soft and comfortable and look good on me. Mm -hmm. And I'm not like walking around like the Tin Man. Uh, so I started to get back into it. And then I became really addicted to this, like, and I'm sure you know this, but like this kind of gamble that you do where you think the measurements are right. Oh yeah. I love that game. Right. Late night yeah. too, when I'm a little foggy. Oh yeah. It's yeah, so, yeah, that, yeah. That's how I live, man. That's, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I've gotten to be pretty good at it. Uh, but yeah, it's I wear a lot of Levi's. I think the... Do I wear any salvage stuff anymore? There's some... I have some of the Buck Mason full saddle jeans. I wear those, those are sometimes. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Carson Watch jeans. Really, really nice wide leg jean. Not salvage, but really nice. Have you tried uh, the Henry's jean? Keith Henry? I see. I mean, his stuff's always sold out, isn't it? Like, it's yeah, like it's gone hard. a second. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that shit looks awesome for sure. Uh, and I listened to the pod you did with him. Yeah, you know, he, was, he was cool. I think it's, you know, it's interesting because you're, you're calling this out too, where I have tried wide leg pants, wider leg pants, skinny pants from crazy Dior, you know, 19 centimeter stuff to basically things that almost resemble like Jinkos now. And even mm -hmm. though I wear those, and I'm curious, like when you kind of were like, look, I'm just settling into my fit. Mm -hmm. um, like my wife and other people have been like, you know what? Like you actually don't look as good as you think you do in some of these things. And it's no mm -hmm. fault of the product. I want to be very clear. It's just mm -hmm. my body type. And yeah. only recently have I been like, you know what? Like it's like a Dickies 874 or a, to be honest, in most cases, the Levi's 501 or those sugar, mm -hmm. sugar canes. Or to be honest, the, the 316 CS is pretty good too. But like mm -hmm. that style, a little bit higher top block, like higher rise, kind of mm -hmm. straight. If there is a taper, it's like one of the most mild, subtle tapers. Yeah. Nothing else really is very flattering on me. And I am in denial because I'll still <laughs> go buy these other things and I look kind of like a shithead. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, 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 know what you're, I know what you're saying. I think the wide leg jeans that I like the most are the ones that like I have sort of Another gamble I've made is that I think these are going to shrink, are going to shrink a little bit over time. And then like, mm -hmm. I had a very wide pair of Carson Watch Indigo jeans and with a few washes, they're like really this awesome, like just a little bit wider than a, you know, just mm -hmm. a little bit wider. So yeah, you never know what you're ending up with. And um, actually my favorite Levi's cut is the 557 for Cowboys that they made in the 80s. Oh yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Um, yeah, it's, it's weird. It's like, it's like a Wrangler rip. It's yeah, I was gonna like, say, or, or the Lee one hundred and one, or something. Or is no the one hundred and one's a jacket. It's the Lee. There's a Lee trouser Lee, or jean that's kind of similar to that too. Lee Ryder. Yeah, it might be. Jean? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, well, this one's cool because it's got like the like the exposed rivets on the top of the back pocket. Yeah, it, it really looks exact. The yoke is the same as a Wrangler jean, and I found these on eBay kind of out of nowhere, and they uh, I I got, I'm wearing them right now because they're my favorites, and I've I've had them like a year, so that's probably my favorite cut ever. And then also for a while, like. I had a trainer that I was like, I'm just going to get as fucking beefy as possible. And then I couldn't wear any 501. So I had to kind of walk that back. Yeah. Uh, I think about like that Lucas Sabat thing where he's like, if you get too buff, you can't wear clothes well anymore. <laughs> so. No, it's true. It's funny because like yeah. there are guys, so I go to this gym and it's interesting because I, for some reason, I feel like this gym that I go to is like the commuter sort of gym because guys will come mm -hmm. in with clothes change into workout clothes and then leave in different ones versus i feel like some mm. gyms everyone enters and leaves in the same clothes they came in right like mm -hmm. i guess this has like nicer showers but every time i'm i'm leaving i see these dudes who are super super jacked and they're wearing just the tightest fitting stuff and you know thighs out and all these like certain things you know and i remember one guy was trying to tell me and this is weird because like i don't know if people talk to you like in the locker room but like I'm in the locker room. I'm getting dressed. And this guy's like, hey, wh what shirt is that? And I was like, oh, this is like a 316 shirt or whatever. And he's like, yeah. He's like, you know what you should wear? He's like, that shirt sucks. He's like, you should wear. <laughs> and he was trying to sell me on those fucking shirts that have like the tighter. I'm not even going to name the brand if you know. I don't want to give him any free ads. But like it has a tighter arm, but a looser mm. stomach. So oh. you look kind of jacked, even though weird. you're you're hiding your stomach. Oh, weird. It's, this is like a kind of like instagram or it's former, an instagram brand know. basically yeah and weird. he was like no this is what you got to wear he's like because then he's like you look super swole 
And I was like, dude, I'm just not that guy. I was like, I got two kids. I'm fine with this shirt. I actually like it a lot. I almost want to flex on and be like, do you fucking know about this shirt, man? <laughs> but like, there's there's that sort of vibe there at the gym. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, yeah. th- I don't know, like th- like people, when you get so big, you all the stuff that kind of looks good, you can't really wear anymore. Because these these guys are pretty big. I mean, I'm not at Gold's Gym or whatever, but it's it's, it's big boys. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting when you talk to someone who's like a, like a really into lifting like that, because like the way that like we would think like oh you know i think i want to buy a uh, something that kind of highlights this about myself they're like sure. i think i'm just gonna i'm just gonna hit traps really heavy this week you know like, <laughs> they are their clothes and so yeah i feel like that's a comment i get a lot on my instagram or instagram or tiktok whatever when i'm talking about jeans they're like i can't fit into anything my thighs are too big i'm a power lifter i'm like then stop power lifting <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I there's really nothing else i can say it's just like clothes were not meant for for that yeah so. i agree or, or you're gonna live in like you know insert activewear brand for all yeah. time and i guess that's fine if that's what you want to do but like yeah because that's the other thing is the guys the other guys i see leave the gym you know and they're going to their whatever real estate group that they work for and they're they're all ultra tight spandexy clothes and it yeah. just i don't know and it's like here, there's people that are listening to this that probably wear that and i mean it's fine if that's really who you want to be all right i respect your own way of, to express yourself but like it's just i just feel like it's not as fun you just look like a superhero at all the time what if what if there's a crime and someone looks to you but you're not prepared for it and it's because you were dressed like a superhero you know and now you're put on the spot and then you actually make things worse have you watched Reacher <laughs> by any chance? Uh, I have. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, this second season, he's looking like unhealthily jacked. It yeah. It's like he's going to explode. But I love <laughs> this is apropos of nothing at all. But I love how much time that show spends on him shopping. <laughs> and like that's, that's a good every, point. Like, every episode, he's like, I'm digging through the bins today <laughs> for my <laughs> new fit. Or he goes to the thrift store. But I just think like, you know, they have to work so hard, like get him a quadruple XL Carhartt jacket and some tailored 501s to like look like he was able to get clothes off the rack. Yeah. Um, but fabulous, fabulous, smooth brain show if you haven't watched it. <laughs> it's a good um, I have my phone in my hand show. It's also oh, a good, so good. show. There's there's certain shows that I watch because like I'll go to the gym, you know, usually every day. It's some workouts are more and, you know, more intense than others. And there's certain shows that like, yeah, I'm going to watch it at the gym. And unfortunately, because I don't have much time at home, a lot of these shows become gym shows. But some shows, I'm like, nope, this is going to stay a gym show. Like Masters of the Air, I'm like, you know what? Probably need to give this a a Mm -hmm. rewatch at home. But there's other shows, and I just won't name names, but you're like, yeah, that's I'm on the elliptical for an hour or something. Fire up the iPad, you know. Oh, Reach is perfect for that. (laughs) Let's get dirty. Yeah. Yeah, I watched it for the first time when I had the flu and I had a fever. And I was like, oh, my God, this shit's so good. It's (laughs) so good. And then then, uh, when my brain temperature returned to normal, I was like, oh. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. I get it. You know. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So Sorry for that. No, it's fine. It's great. (laughs) So when does you becoming like the gene daddy of TikTok enter? Because I feel like you've now become this de facto resource for classic menswear. And I think, I mean, to, if we had to go way back to the beginning in my intro, that would have been more of what I would have tried to to say to gas you up. Because like, I think that's where you're not the guy who's championing these Instagram brands. You're talking about brands that are decades, hundreds of years old, whatever. Mm-hmm. That's very much on this classic menswear thing. So mm-hmm. w- when do you kind of become that guy? Um. Yeah. So, I mean, I think 2021 was around the time I left Selfedge. And I was leaving Selfedge partially to work on a script that I was writing. And I just, you know, I I just felt like I'd had a good run there, but I needed to make a, a new move. And I just wasn't sure what that thing was. But, you know, it was like, it was, we were still in the pandemic and cost yeah. of living besides rent was not, I was, all I had to pay was rent, right? So I saved some money and, and there was really nothing else to do. And, um... My roommate at the time, she was back east visiting her parents and I'd like gone through a breakup pretty around that time. And I was kind of just generally bummed out. And that was the first time I downloaded TikTok, which I had heard, you know, people just were just really dunking on TikTok at every opportunity. They were saying it was... It's the dancing app. 
It's a dancing app. Yeah. And then I got on there and I mean, I was like, I, as the algorithm began to understand me, it, it never gave me any fashion. It still doesn't give me any fashion stuff. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. It, it's like just like stuff I thought was funny, but I was like, this is crazy. I wonder what the men's fashion stuff is on here. And it was so stupid. And <laughs> so I've always, I mean, working in retail, a big part of it is just like riffing with the other people there. You know, like yeah. <laughs> as soon as the door closes and like, someone who was a menace all day leaves you're like his fit was fucking whack you know and <laughs> <laughs> so you like and then you also but like there's that part there's like the kind of teasing part but there's also the part where like you've learned so much yeah and you can't really just tell the customer like look these are the rules <laughs> uh you have to kind of like cajole them gently into the right thing so i had all this like pent up like i want to just say what the rules are what like the way things should be and so I made a video that was kind of obliquely about fashion and then that did well. It was one of my first. And then I just kind of kept doing There's really no like I was I was working hard on making TikToks. And yeah, fine. it was just like, which I think is the way it needs to happen. It was just like, bam, here we are. And I had, you know, my friends weren't really into clothes that much in that way. And so I didn't really have people to talk about it with. And so I started just like talking about that stuff online. and. It just really just it was just like a runaway train, really. And then I it just was a ton of fun. And like, I felt like there was this real hunger to hear about clothes in a different way, you know, different than the like, get ready with me or different. Yeah. Than jumping into your outfit, <laughs> jumping into your clothes <laughs> or just like people being like the thing that you need to have is this or throw everything away and get this, which is also kind of like I was listening to your uh, the Bruce Boyer podcast yeah yeah you, bruce is yeah bruce really released, yeah we're like so much of he was like his articles were about like or pre predating him fashion articles were like get rid of everything you have and start anew and that's kind of how people were doing tiktok with fashion stuff or it was just so like if your sneakers are this color your pants need to be this color it, it just was there was just no thought and i remember one of my early early videos i was talking about vintage and i was getting comments from people who are probably teenagers and they're like what is vintage uh, uh oh. And I was like, oh my God. So we have to start at the bottom here. <laughs> and at the start, I felt like I was just kind of like a big brother kind of figure. Yeah. Where it was like, you know, I got to give a little history. I got to just show, like, hey, you know, the OG 107 fatigue pant. You can find that on eBay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the 507, if you're, if it's, if there's no 107s around. And uh, it was just really simple stuff like that. And a lot of it was just like, but it's, you know, there, there are, roadblocks because i think people are really used to being spoon-fed something or they're like link to that thing and it's like i'm it's not that simple <laughs> yeah you know? yeah that's um, a good point because there's a bit of a like instant gratification method or idea that's kind of ingrained in a lot of people's minds because of the internet and because of like one click shopping and i mean because I, I do think that's one of the things i like a lot about your videos because like for me i'll go on and it's like your videos and then it's like how to repair drywall which both are very good because I don't know shit about home reno and because I'm doing that, it's like, hey, ding dong, this is how you, you know, hang a door. And then your stuff, it was like kind of tongue in cheek, but it's, you know, yeah, it's not get ready with me. Like in a weird way, I don't think you make yourself the center of attention in the videos, but when you do, it's very like humorous, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think like that is a, that's a style that is kind of like egoless, but ends up looking the best anyway you know yeah i don't know i, I I'm, yeah. it's hard to put my finger on but yeah i mean i felt like when i first heard throwing fits this is how i felt this is how i felt i was like oh i haven't heard people like being this like outrageously sort of funny about this thing that so many people take seriously yeah and that was something that i really admired about them and and i've tried to and that was kind of the way that i would talk to some of my friends that were into clothes you know like really riffing on it in this way Mm -hmm. And um, so I tried to bring a little bit of that to the table. And and then also just I think that like, you know, also that was kind of there's a big shift in that time from then to now where, you know, influencer was kind of a was a bad word still. I yeah. think. Yeah, I and, agree. And then it's sort of and now I mean, they call them content creators, which I think is such a I don't know. I mean, I guess that's what I am, but it sounds like a BS term. No, you're not uh, a content creator. You're just you're a guy who also makes content. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, it was just like, I was like, what if you had someone that was just kind of making fun of it or showing, what if I just got to see things that were like vintage and cool? And then I think the, and it was interesting because like a lot of the stuff that I was trying to say, it was a little more abstract. It wasn't really like buy this brand. I was like, hey, things should fit this way. Yeah. I just happened to be wearing this. But then what people did, which was interesting, was they were like, oh, I want that thing though. And then so sometimes a criticism I get from, you know, anonymous bot, not bot accounts, anonymous accounts is they're like, they want, you want everyone to dress like you. And I'm like, that's not really what I want. I just want people to dress you know, in ways that are comfortable for them. But it, I have a, a style and I'm not like really leaving my, you know, niche anytime soon. So it just comes across like that way, I guess. No, it's it's funny because I had a person, you know, I've had people like say the same things when I've talked about like, oh, you should have a Navy sport coat or you should have this, you know. And one guy was like, hey, I really don't like how you're trying to, you know, dog how I express myself. And, for, and, it, and this is the thing, like if people comment or send me an email, mm-hmm. I'm going to respond. Mm-hmm. I'm never rude. I want to be very clear. But I was like, well, first off, I was like, hi, my name is Jeremy. I don't, I don't, I've never met mm-hmm. you. I don't know anything about what you wear. You know, I was like, but never in a million years would I try to tell you that you're not allowed to express yourself. Like, please don't try to get some sort of like, you know, whatever, some bizarro political thing at me. But like, you can wear whatever you want. But I think mm-hmm. there are certain things. And I tried to explain to him, you know, and mm-hmm. this is the thing, because the dude was a troll. I'll just say this. I tried to explain to him. I was like, there are brands that I love mm-hmm. that I can't wear because it's mm-hmm. not as flattering on me. And then I even went further because he kept, you know, pushing me that I started to send him pictures of shapes and how certain shapes complement other shapes. And I'm like, imagine the shape is a person. And he's like, but a person contains my-. And I was like, Fuck. Don't feed the trolls. I was like, I, and I realized <laughs> that I know I couldn't win. But like, that's a thing that I, like, I'm never trying to tell anyone that they're not allowed yeah. to be whoever they want to be but like there are things that in some cases sound better yeah. look better it's just i don't know why does navy look good i don't mm-hmm. i don't i don't know yeah. but navy looks good no yeah. I, I i agree <laughs> and yeah i think it's i had i had a comment like that or dm yesterday that was sort of like that it was like there's just no point in getting into this but this guy was like albert you used to suggest brands that oh, were wait. you know available to the common working man and now everything, and now that you got a little bit what of the? clout, like you just don't care anymore. And I'm like, like I, I can't help you. Like if you look closely, I am still wearing the vintage Levi's I had two years ago because I wear the shit that I. You know, it's like, like you know, two thirds of any given outfit is all stuff that I scrounged on eBay for dirt cheap. But it's just you can't really explain it. It's just it's it's just too. It's not straightforward enough to like to dilute into a very quick little quip, and it's hard. And um, yeah, but I mean. I'm sure, yeah, the dealing with the people online that are misunderstanding you is always uh, trying, to say the least. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's a very, there's a parasocial relationship that begins to happen from any sort of person that makes mm-hmm. any form of content, whether it's, or, or someone who learns about someone and gets mm-hmm. a relationship with them indirectly, right, parasocially. And how that, that when you start to have good or bad days, when you're bad, when it's a rough day, I remember I like some woman hit my car and like really fucked up my car and I like posted it on Mm -hmm. social media because I was just pissed and overwhelming. You know, one guy was like, hey, man, do you want a DoorDash (laughs) gift card? I was like, thank you, but I'm good, you know, but all these people, they're just like they're down. They're down there with you, man. We're so sorry. Life sucks. And then if anything, you know, good happens, whether I get a Rolex show (laughs) a a watch. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Something like that. To where, like, it's like, oh, uh-huh. he's a rich guy now. Oh, I, what, you know. And then people would then say, like, mean things to me. Like, one guy wrote, like, whose D did you have to suck to get that? And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Like, stop. Like, stop, you know. And, and uh, this person, he's like, people want you to do well, but never better than them. And once, once someone interprets you yeah. being, like, better off than they are, how, you know, whether it's true or not. Um, then they're out for you. And I think that's a tough thing that anyone, you know, because people are like, man, Jeremy, I knew you and you were in New York and you had this and you didn't have any kids and now you got a kid and now you live in a house. And it's like, well, first off, I make way less money. 
Second, I live in the suburbs in St. Louis. But sure, yeah, I, I have th- this watch that you somehow think. But it's like I can't explain for three hours about how I've been buying and selling for 10 years and moved this into this and this. Mm-hmm. You know, it just doesn't yeah. exist. It doesn't help. And, I th- and you know, I it sounds like you get a little bit of that yourself when people are like, oh, I knew you when you were into the common man. And now that you're, you know... Yeah. sponsored by blank and blank yeah it's just like don't you want me to be happy don't you want me to afford <laughs> yeah, health care i mean it's also like i think <laughs> i think people that the the influencer parasocial stuff is so complicated and it's unfortunately yes something that occupies a lot of my brain space on a given day but i think no yeah i mean it's just my life it's like these are my coworkers, are these, you know are these people on my phone but <laughs> i think like i at At its best, an influencer or a content creator that is into fashion is like like window dressing for a store. And like, I think at its Mm. very best, if you can consume it in the most healthy way possible, they're going to have like all these things. It's going to be a revolving door of like they're wearing this, they get this, they get that, they get that. And it's never it's never like you need all of these things to be happy. It's like more like a store window where it's like, oh, I think I like how that looked with that thing. Maybe I'll consider that in the future. It's like I think that's the healthy way to consume it. But because of the culture because of everything that surrounds this culture, there's so much of like, if you want to be happy, you need this. So it's like, and there's so many people that are so, so I feel like when people are upset with me, sometimes they can be rightfully upset with me. But I I think also sometimes it's like, it's just this culture that they're used to. And they see me as a part of this, like a bastion of this, this, uh, this larger, yeah, this larger culture of like, really like shoving things down Mm. your throat and like, And that's the thing. It's like, I get kind of offended when people are like mad at me for it, for a a number of things when it's like, like, if you just like scroll down your FYP a little bit, you're going to find some like influencer who is way more egregious in his consumption or whatever than I have ever been. So, you know, I always feel like I'm, I'm, but whatever. And then there's, I I, sorry to keep going there. I don't know if you ever saw this, but I once made a video where I said that cowboys didn't exist, which was a joke. And (laughs) It went the the <laughs> hate that I got for that was insane. So I can say anything I want on the internet, and like a couple thousand people will think I'm telling the truth. And with sometimes it's mm. so fun to do that, but sometimes it's like I just was trying to have a regular day, and now these guys think I think cowboys aren't real. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was quoted out of context on that Hedinki article, and oh, right, every right. now and then. I'll get a message where someone's like, hey, did you leave your wife to get that watch? Did you leave her dead dying somewhere? And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, and that's the thing where it's like the the little preacher's kid in me, the like humble, please like me, I'm mm-hmm. radically insecure and I spend tons of money on therapy, like wants to find a way to yeah. win this person over versus it's just like, you know what? Some people, they're just going to be ring dings and you just got to move on. But like that, that stuff haunts me a ton. And the, the, you know, and this was the one thing that like happened the other day where like, I don't know if you ever feel this. And it's great because you, you know, you do acting and you, you're like pursuing all these other things where a part of me was like, oh no, is anyone going to give a shit about me five, six years from now when I'm trying to pay for, you know, my kid's school for this and this and I, and it's over. But like on more than one occasion, I've been like, well, maybe I'll go work back at Starbucks or I'll go work here and I'll do this so I can get this health insurance so I can do that. Because I'm terrified Mm -hmm. of the future. And then I realized that all my other friends who have these more sort of traditional air quoting jobs, that everyone's kind of in this thing where it's like there's a bit of uncertainty of what the future looks like. And you just kind of like grin and bear it. I don't know. I mean, I feel that for sure. It's like, I mean, especially with, you know, something like what I'm doing where it's like, it's literally the numbers are right in front of you. It's like, how popular are you at a given moment? And it's like, if people aren't fucking with you, then you're just not going to get paid. You know, if like, if people aren't fucking with you, then yeah. then the brands are not going to care. You know, they're and then when the numbers are crazy, they'll come to your email and they'll act like we've just been loving what you've been doing. And it's like, yeah, fucking right. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, there are obviously exceptions to that. Rule. We're there huge people, fans of you over yeah, here. <laughs> uh, there are exceptions to that rule. And there are people that like that, you know, take a chance, have taken mm-hmm. chances on me and like supported me. And uh, and that means a lot. But there also there's the kind of more more so it's the it's the other stuff so i get that i mean you are i'm always trying to like when i feel like i have momentum i just like put the pedal to the metal and just like post as much as i can because it's like hell yeah yeah, you just got to keep it keep it running so so 
you're also doing, do you just finish a play? Did you just rap on this play, the LBJ play? So, yeah, I'm in a play called LBJ the Play. It is about Lyndon Johnson, the president, uh, and a lot of other things. And it, we're actually coming back in May uh, for the Netflix is a joke comedy festival. So uh, and hopefully yeah. after that, we can we really want to do a New York run. And I think it would the play would make a lot of sense in New York. So, yeah, it's a, did you brush up on your how much of your history knowledge were you uh, <laughs> exercising in LBJ the play as someone who has not seen it and knows nothing about it? So forgive me. I think it sort of benefits the show that I in particular have not brushed up a tremendous amount. Um, I, 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 okay. play, I play John F. Kennedy, among other parts. So in, it's all based on the Robert Caro LBJ biographies. So I did... Yeah, I've actually read yeah. almost all of them because uh, they're like six years long. I know, they're <laughs> crazy. But I, I, did, I did read uh, pretty much all the JFK bits just to get kind of the uh, get, in, get in character. Um, it's a really fun show. It's kind of more fun if people don't know what it's about. These are people I've done comedy with since college, oh, cool. mostly, and um, they're extremely talented. And uh, yeah, it's like it's crazy fun. And if, if anyone here listening is in LA May third, the show is at Dynasty Type. Oh yeah, and uh, love Dynasty yeah, Type. To, yeah, we'd love to have them. And it's really hard to it's really hard to get my audience to like go to a play I'm in because <laughs> I think you know you get invited to plays. Yeah, someone shouting from a stage. Talk ad- about jeans. <laughs> <laughs> basically no but i mean like it's rare that as an adult you get invited to a play or a comedy show and it doesn't suck so some truth to that i sometimes. promise yeah it doesn't suck <laughs> yeah so we're still um we're still kind of winning people over to that um so earlier you were talking about that you studied history yeah so i am obsessed with specific for me it's usually world war ii mm-hmm. era history mm-hmm. but also presidential history mm. like i just just finished today, which I'm very proud of, the Grant Cherno book, which took a long time to finish because uh, it's huge. It's like, I don't know, it's like two, three inches thick. Oh, I yeah. had to finish it on an audio book. But are there any like books like, you know, whether they're biographies or whatever that you've read that are your favorites? Oh, yeah. Um, there's a history of Mexico City. I think it's called La Ciudad. Oh. Um, it's really good. It's like the entire, like from pre, you know, obviously from pre-Columbian times to I guess like the 80s. Yeah. Um, that's really good. Uh, actually, a really good book that I read recently. Uh, is it just called? I think it's just called. Oh, it's called The Golden Thread by Cassia St. Clair. It's a history of like thre- different threads. And it's like there's okay. a whole part on wool. There's a whole part on cotton. There's a whole part on silk. The chapter on silk is amazing. Because uh, it talks about like the Silk Road and all that stuff. Or Yeah. Oh, yeah, interesting. Yeah. That's a historian. Her name is Cassia St. Clair. I actually got to go on her podcast to talk about. Oh, OK. Yeah, she yeah, does yeah. Like a, Um, the dandy so yeah the dandy and uh i really liked that i'm reading more like fat like a fabric history books read what's it is it was it no yeah dana thomas well there is also dana thomas franklin right house but there's dana thomas the journalist who did um fashionopolis she did deluxe i think a lot of people love that book that like how luxury lost its luster um she's pretty cool i mean she she kind of like has traced a lot of the histories not history, but like a lot of the origins of some Arno and the LVMH kind of rise. And because I, I feel like there will eventually be some sort of Cherno style book on, you know, the Arno family. Um, like mm-hmm. I finished The House of Morgan not that long ago, which is a, um, it's another Cherno book. I mean, I just kind of went nuts on, on him. Um, but it kind of like talks about like modern American finance and like all these like crazy dudes. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, there's, I mean, that it's as so as a person who I do not have a college degree. Um, just went nuts and have talked to all my friends who have been to college and all this stuff and been like, tell me all the books that you read that changed your life, you know? And so it's like a lot of these just like reading more now as like, you know, a person in my late thirties, you know, it's, it's, it hits different, I guess, when it it's not an assignment. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I think a lot of the, a lot of the history books I read in school were super dry, Yeah, you know, and, and then like after you read like five of those, then you had a really compelling conversation with the, that tied it yeah. together. But um, a lot of the books that I've like, um, there's a historian, her name is Candace Millard, mm-hmm. and she does a lot of books on like the history of like various like explorers, you know, f- you know, d- quote unquote discover. There's one she did on the hi- discovery of the Nile. Oh, OK. Quote unquote discovery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and she's really good i love those like kind of uh, yeah that kind of historian that writes like a really compelling narrative um and 
I love just all the like fun facts in the way that all these like peculiar characters in history have crossed paths and um, love that. So yeah, I'm always kind of reading some sort of history book. It kind of, I think that's really important, especially because my brain is so fried from being on the internet so much Yeah, to kind of absorb some, something interesting and um, especially any good like book on fashion or the history thereof. It's helpful to kind of bring me back to, to earth a little. I read, I read Killers of the Flower Moon, so I didn't really feel like I needed to see a three hour or four hour movie of a book I'd already read. Same. And I also read a really amazing book on Los Alamos and the Manhattan Project. So I was like, again, I'm not going to go see Oppenheimer. I, I've read the book. <laughs> There's no way Nolan got any more information into this than I already have. I don't know which of the which I just read. I don't think it is necessarily the source material for the movie, but just there was a really good history of Los Alamos that I read that I was like, OK, I got it. Yeah. OK, here's a favorite author. And yes, William Manchester did the Churchill books. He did the last line. He's also probably most famous for doing the JFK assassination stuff. But William Manchester did this one mm-hmm. book called A World Lit Only by Fire, which is basically a history of from the Dark Ages to the Renaissance. Oh, wow. That sounds like my shit. And a lot of people hate his writing because he writes like historians will sometimes, you know, poop poo poo on his writing because his writing is like kind of novelized in the sense that like he mm-hmm. writes it's like you're reading Game of Thrones in a way. Mm. Oh, you I know, see, I see, I it's see. not so much like fact one, fact two, fact three, all facts together equal fact five. You know, it's it's all just like it feels like an adventure book, um, mm-hmm. but they're fucking great. Anywho. So did you you mentioned watches you did you recently get a date just or did you get a new date just because you were always wearing like a black bay or then this Tudor you had a black bay like 36 or something. Yes, yes, yes. Then you went 58 and now you have a, a Rolex. Yeah, yeah. I got it. I got a from Craft and Taylor. I got a two tone date just from 1971. OK. And yeah. And now I'm like, oh, boy, here we go. Yeah, <laughs> it's like I mean, I love I love Tudor so much. It's cool. This is the first time I bought a watch and it's also made me appreciate my other watches, you know? like Oh, that's rare. Sometimes. Yeah, because, yeah, usually it's like if I buy something, I'm like, oh, I'm just going to wear I'll this. I'll sell forever. the other ones or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, haven't sl- I haven't sold anything, luckily, but I think having the date just and like getting, this is my first like vintage watch experience and getting to wear this. And it's so like, it's not an everyday piece. It's really like I got it for the kind of like, you know, 70s porn star vibe of it all. Yeah. Um, and then, but then like, it makes me when I put on my, um, either my black bays, but usually my black bay 58, I'm like, this watch is so fucking cool. And I don't know, like, especially cause I got to go to craft and tailored and I got to like try on everything. Uh-huh. And it's like, I'd never had access to this stuff. This is not something that anybody cared about that I knew. And it's again, that thing of like, you know, you do all this research online. You're like, oh, a sub would be cool. A GMT. And then like when you see the ones that are in your price range, they're like, they're not, they're not right. Or they're too whatever. Or, yeah. So I feel like I'm just beginning to crack the surface of this whole thing. I'm just so stoked. Dude, it's, it's watch stuff for me has always been the most fun because it doesn't change that much. You know what I mean? Like yeah. if, you know, especially as someone who's getting into clothes, there's so many different, you know, little areas and things are always moving and they're always, it can be, you know, mm-hmm. two years ago, you're wearing this, this year, you're wearing this, whatever. And watch is like, it's like, you know, we did that, that number four is now blue. And you're like, wow, it's just, there's mm-hmm. the slightest bit of evolution and refinement and all the things that you get. I imagine, I don't know, maybe you will never sell whatever, but like, Almost every watch I get, I'm like, I'm never going to sell this. And then a couple years from now, I'm like, well, you know, if I sell this, I'm already more than halfway towards this. And you just... I see, I see. And I mean, because in a lot of ways, I mean, that's how the Daytona and other stuff arrived, where it's just like, you know, and my wife has this like rule of like no new money for stuff. So... Uh, Recycle the money. (laughs) Yeah. So it's just like, okay, if you want to get blank, you need to sell A, B, C, and D or whatever to get that. And I feel like watches yeah. are the best, best stuff for it. But, you know, because I'm I'm surprised. No no shade to Tudor. Love Tudor. Black Bay 58, one of the greatest watches of all time. But I'm surprised you haven't sold one of those yet to then put you towards, I don't know, whatever else you you just got super into. Oh, no. I think I want to keep them forever if I can. Like, I just, I had the Black Bay 36 for three years. Okay. I I got it during the pandemic. And, and it was the first time. Before that, I had a Nomos. That was like the watch I got for you my said had graduation. you don't have it anymore. 
I still have okay, it. Okay, good. I, for that, that was my everyday wear. Well, I guess. What I Nomos wear was it? Day anymore. The uh, Club Campus. Oh, yeah. Great watch. I have a Tengente yeah. Neomatic, and they're f- fucking great. I know most very, very, very underrated brand. Yeah. Well, so I just think like watches are so. I mean, so basically, I always wore like all through college, I wore a Swiss Army like Victorinox watch that my mom had gotten me. And when I graduated, she gave me this Nomos. And honestly, I was like, like at the time, I was bumped. I was like, what the? Fuck? <laughs> like, I wanted like a leather jacket or something. But I had literally never thought about watches. It had never once mattered to me. Wow. And like, I was already into clothes, which is crazy. I had never even thought that, to me, watches always had batteries. I didn't even know that like anything else existed. Or you had to shake them. Or you just, yeah. yeah, I, yeah, I didn't It's one of those it. shake watches. So, but yeah, she got me the Nomos. And I was like, okay, you know. And it's like, also like, it's cool. But like, you don't understand that it's cool because it's your mom that got it for you. So yeah, I wore it for a while. And then when I interviewed with Kia to work at Selfedge, Kia, who has the best of everything, obviously. Yeah. He was like, that's really cool. You have a Nomos. And I was like, you know this? And he's like, yeah, that's cool. Like, I, I don't see those around. And um, that kept happening when I worked at Selfedge. Like a guy in like a crazy, you know, Nautilus or something would be like, oh, I've I've never seen a Nomos in real life. And I was like, wait, this is. And I, I you know, since have thanked my mom profusely, like I understand now that it was a cool thing. And it's really fun that like a watch that's not that expensive in the scheme of watches can like produce kind of like a pretty joyful effect in someone who has things that are way, you know, objectively well, not objectively cooler, that are way more expensive, maybe. Yeah. I mean, where I'm curious where your mom found or got into Nomos. So she read a New Yorker article written by Gary Steingart. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then since then, I realized like my watch tastes have really reflected like his because, um, you know, like when I, so, you know, and then Johan, obviously big watch guy. Mm-hmm. And I was learning kind of from him and from our customers and, you know, I was kind of looking and I was, you know, doing research. And then I, I was like, at the time, I thought I'll never be able to get one of these like Rolexes or anything. And then I kind of found, you know, Tudor came into the picture. And I think the Explorer 1016 is like the ideal mm-hmm. in my mind. Mm-hmm. And then so I got the Black Bay 36, actually partially because a customer came in with a Black Bay 58. And I thought, that's really, I said to him, that's such a cool watch. I've been looking at it online. He's like, do you want to try it on? Yeah, that's and the ultimate flex. You it. immediately take your watch off if someone compliments you on it. You're like, here you go. This is not as yeah. precious to me, even though it's the most precious thing I have. <laughs> but like that act of like of generosity it made me see, oh, I could wear one of these. So I did the 36 and I wore that for three years. And honestly, I thought I was just going to have that for the rest of my life and I wouldn't have been happy with it. But then it was my birthday last year and and I went into a dealer and I was like, do you guys have a Black Bay 58? And she was like, no, we have a Black Bay 54, but it's on hold for a customer. And I was like, oh, can I see it? And then she came out and it was a Black Bay 58. And I was like, that's not a Black Bay 54. Oh my God. And she was like, oh, do you want it? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I guess I'll buy it. Yeah, sure. They should not be selling Tudor. Yeah. They just fucking quoted the <laughs> wrong watch to a new customer. <laughs> but it worked in my favor. So. Yeah, good for you. Yeah. So then, and then I just, you know, it's just, it's been an exciting year. It's been a, a lot of new landmarks. And so are you doing with acting stuff? Are you, do you have any other projects or stuff that you're working on? Or do you like, I, I'm so ignorant to like the grind of, like auditioning and stuff like is do you see yourself kind of going more into that or what i mean i'm gonna take it as it comes i just just in the last month okay have i actually have i gotten my first theatrical acting agent hey so like okay and that's like this is like seven years out of college you know yeah 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 and because part of the reason I started doing all this was like i was like if i can get these followers they can see i'm marketable and then they're gonna cast me yeah but it's like you know, like I hit 200K, they're like, mm, not yet. You know, I hit that. I add another 200K on another website, and they're like, mm, not yet. So finally, have I got a good agent? And finally, am I auditioning for stuff? And that means it could be years still till I get to do anything. But um, I'm really happy. And I kind of want it all to happen always, you know, like, because I'm always going to love the clothes. And it's like, I still, if I find some new eBay rabbit hole and I can make a video about it and people get excited, like, that's awesome. And I, I want to hopefully be able to do all of it for as long as i can and maybe more acting and the play you know we're getting a lot of traction with that and hopefully we'll get to keep that running or get it taped or do something like that so but i'm at you know it's like the weird part about the job that i have now and like the content creation in quotes stuff is that you know your your life 
is is consumed in such a way that like people see the work in progress mm-hmm. a lot of times yeah. and and part of me wishes like yeah i kind of wish that like none of this had happened and just one day i popped up in a movie and then like that was my life but um that ain't how it is <laughs> so yeah people are gonna be along with, for the ride with me on this one yeah i mean it's it's interesting you say that because like there's a, a few friends of mine who act or do stuff and they've talked about like how much like how hard it is now because yeah a lot of people there's there's not really any form of like you were saying where you just pop up in something and then you're this kind of like overnight success a lot of people you you kind of grind your way to that point and so people get to see you when you're here you know when you're down mm-hmm. here and you work your way up to there and he was like or they were like, you know, if people saw all the early stuff that I did, they would never want me to be in something like this now. You know, like you, you just yeah. not like they were doing things that were bad, but just like, you know, it's whether it's a commercial for Cocoa Puffs or something, well, you know, all these things that you're just trying yeah. to do to like find a way to get your foot in the door. And it's like now everyone's yeah. like my whole life is on public display for, you know, that stuff until until you get to a, a part where. It doesn't need to be on public display anymore. And then do you lose all the people who were with you when everything was, you know, it's just this, then this vicious cycle. I don't know. It's, I mean, it's like, I experienced that, you know, in the last few years with, even with the brands I want to work with, where it's like, you know, I, sh- I'm sh- like, they're just not willing to do the stuff that I'm doing or there are a lot of the kind of serious menswear brands only recently are like, okay, yeah, we'll do, we'll get on TikTok. We'll, we'll try and mix, you know? And so you're kind of always, especially if you've done this kind of thing, you're, you're always dealing with people's preconceived notions about like the dancing app or whatever. And they're always kind of, they're always, it feels like kind of underestimating the power of it and like how you can, how you can weaponize sounds violent, but the way you can utilize the platforms for something, you know, greater. And so, yeah, you're, it's just, people are a little bit, you know, the people in charge are, are used to saying no and they're older and they're maybe not really using these things and um so yeah i mean hopefully hopefully the the dumb stuff i've done online does not prevent me from getting where i want to be but i think uh, i don't think it will i think we're we're headed in the right direction fine yeah agreed well yeah. albert thank you so much for coming on this was a pleasure thank you uh yeah it was it was great to chat i'm glad we got to do this yeah man. thank you jeremy this means a lot i'm really glad you got to do this yeah for sure i'll see ya You've been listening to Blamo. Our show is produced by Blamo Media. We're edited by Amar Lowell and our theme music, as always, by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. If you like what you heard, you know the drill. Share the pod with a friend. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Give us five stars or thumbs up on whatever other thing you're listening to us on, whether it's Dingledorp or Bing Bong, whatever it's called. But you can also follow us on Instagram for all the hot content. If you want to talk to us and give us your hot take, we'd love to hear from you. You can send us an email at info at blamopod.com. Last but not least, super ultra important. If I had an air horn, I would press it right now. You got to come and join us over on Patreon because the fun never stops over there. Look, the the, the live show, the, the, the free show, whatever you want to call this, we take breaks here and there. But Patreon, it never stops. And we also got exclusive shows like Die Workwear, hosted by Derek Guy and Peter Zatolo, and The Triple J Show, hosted by yours truly with uh, John Moy and Gene DeLeon. There's there's just a ton of stuff over there. So check it out at patreon.com forward slash blamo. If not, no worries. We got hundreds and hundreds of free episodes in the feed and uh, more to come. So we will see you all soon. 